Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study, our book of Luke. We're going to get right into it. We're going to go with chapter 2 here, verse 39 in a moment. Luke the light giver, and certainly we see light in this. <clears throat> Luke saying, I'm going to write this letter more concise. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to go right into the details, and he does. He's mentioned Simeon here, and also he mentions Hana or Anna. Uh, at the temple 84 years only he does this but he it is more concise and naturally Joseph and Mary were though Mary was familiar that the angel Gabriel had come had spoken to her the angel that stands before God but yet at the same time as people witnessed to by the Holy Spirit drawn to this lad this babe amazed them and um, and they marveled so we just finished um, dealing with the uh, Hannah that uh, the Lord had uh, had given her that message we pick it up with verse 39 to continue verse 39 chapter 2 the great book of Luke the light giver and it reads and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord they returned into Ga into Galilee to their own own city Nazareth and uh, here this branch town uh, they would they would go uh, in the Aramaic tongue a country town where he would grow verse 40 and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him naturally he was the living word walking in the flesh this lad was as he matured into manhood. Verse 41, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And you know what is amazing? That this lad, though he would go to Passover, he would become our Passover. As it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, he would be that lamb slain at a Passover not too many years hence. And through that blood, we have redemption of sins. We have salvation because of this one and because he did become our Passover. 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. At 12, when, at 12 years old, that's kind of beginning the age of accountability. And... Um, uh, and uh, this number 12 was always so prevalent in our Father's Word that there were 12 tribes of Israel and, um, and the girl that he would bring back to life would be 12 years old. The woman with the flow of blood would be for 12 years. He would heal her. Verse 43, <clears throat> And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Now, this you can read a great deal into this. They were not concerned as the family, the whole family gathers together. Uh, Christ evidently never gave them any trouble because they weren't the least bit worried about it, not even enough to check on him. That lets you know how faithful he had been to the family, the fact that he never gave any concern and or worries, that they're going to get a full day's travel out before he's even missed by them. That's how much they trusted him, they loved him, and how trouble-free as a lad he was. Verse 44, And they supposing him to have been in the company went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolks and acquaintances, began to look around for him. 45, And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. They were worried. They were concerned, naturally, as a mother would be. 
that her child was not there. This child that Gabriel had even announced the conception thereof. This child that Simeon had uh, approached in the temple with the Holy Spirit speaking through him. And Anna, this uh, prophetess, a woman teacher, 84 years in the temple giving witness to this one. He was gone. And they could not find him. A full day's travel, 46. And it came to pass that after three days, I mean, that mother must have been worried. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. This, this must have been an awesome thing to the muckety ducks downtown in the temple, the so-called scholars of the word, 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And how little did they know that right sitting among them was the living word. 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Why did you do this to us? Behold, thy father and I have, have sought the sorrowing. We were worried to death. Now, I want you to note that the father in this verse is lower case. Why? Because it was speaking of Joseph, his adopted father. Joseph was not the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you must, you must realize that before, or you're not going to understand the next verse. What did he say? And this would be the first word spoken in the scripture by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is his first utterance. His last utterance in the word would be, it is finished, as he would pass on that cross. But here begins his first words, 49, and he said unto them, how is it that you sought me, question? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business uh, or in my father's house? Notice the uppercase, Father Almighty God, okay? In other words, where, where would you expect me to find me? You would naturally look in my father's house. That's where you would find me. And, and actually, that, that is true. That um, here, the only begotten child of Almighty God in God's own temple, issuing the commandments of God and remembering all the way back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive. She shall have a, a, a child and you will name him Emmanuel, being interpreted to say God with us. So here they had the Godhead, basically not the Godhead, but the presence of God through the Son sitting among them in his Father's house. That's, that, would be, um, that would be concise. That's where you would look, and that's where you would find him. And, and there you have the first writings and the first words of the Christ child. And, and um, so it is. Verse 50. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. They didn't, and naturally, but you do. I'm sure they would figure it out. 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. He, he obeyed them, was a good lad, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And mothers always do that. They... They remember these things, and they tuck them away, and they make notes. Uh, verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, that is to say age, and in favor with God and man. I mean, he was popular. Everybody liked him. You couldn't help liking him. And naturally, we know from history that from the time he was 12, up until he would begin the ministry. Now, we're not speaking Bible here, but I will insert just a short statement that we know that there was one person that was exceptionally drawn to him, and that was Mary's uncle and his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea. Because we know from history recorded in Glastonbury, England, 
that he traveled there to the ten mines of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very rich person. And he would go there with him and spend time there, which much, much very rich history was left behind there in Glastonbury by this one. But as he matures and he comes on to age, chapter 3, verse 1, now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetriarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetriarch of Aturia, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetriarch of Abilene, or, I mean, reaching all the way out, all the way down to Abilene. Verse 2, Annas, um, that is to say, he, the, the head judge there, and Caiaphas, Caiaphas meaning depression, he was depressed, be, was depressing. Uh, being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. In other words, this would be John the Baptist. The word came to him in the wilderness. He was that one that would proceed and announce the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the last prophet, you might say, before the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 3, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there old John was, right down by the River Jordan, the descender being what the word means, uh, baptizing and preaching the good news. Verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, that's to say Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. That's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And so this one was. But remember back to um, the chapter 1 and 15 and 16 that Zacharias was told that this one would come, not that he would be Elias, but that he would come in the spirit of Elias. And so it was. Um, verse 5, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Now, has that come to pass yet? Of course, no, it hasn't. But it will be in the rejuvenation. It will be. Well, wonder, well, why would he make the prophecy? Well, they didn't receive him. As Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 11, the, John the Baptist would have been Elijah, had they received him, they didn't receive him, they beheaded him. And so, but ultimately at the second advent, at the end of the thousand years, this will come to pass. Verse 6, And all flesh, how much? All flesh shall see the salvation of God. It will be that obvious. Verse 7, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, and this word generation means offspring. Evidently some Kenites had appeared down checking up. I mean, he was emptying out the churches. He was messing up the churches and their income big time. They showed up to find out what was going on down by the Jordan. And John, naturally recognizing them spiritually and otherwise, spiritual discernment. O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Um, well, well, my word, why would John say something like that? Well, um, uh, John the Baptist said that because have you never read chapter 8, verse um, uh, where these same ones would say uh, as, as, as they came forth, um, uh, they would say, well, let's go one more verse, verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. I want to see it's what John said. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. 
For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. In other words, God can convert whomever he chooses, that is to say, if, if they willingly so do it. You have to understand what the word Abraham means in the Hebrew tongue to understand this. It means the father of many nations. So truly, even uh, that would be the nation even of the Kenites, if they would believe. But uh, let's go to St. John. This is not John the Baptist, but the book of St. John, where th this same group was questioning Christ himself. You're not going to have it, but listen to it. I mean, it's chapter 8, the great book of St. John, verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You're not cutting it, friend. That's, you're not producing the fruit. Verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father, lower case. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. You put a little pressure on a Kenite and he'll squirm. What did Christ say? Listen carefully. 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would, have, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. You only begotten. Verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. In the simplicity that Christ taught, they could not hear. You don't want to know why? Christ tells them. 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Well, now let's see who was that. Who was the first murderer? Well, well it was Cain, of course. Every child knows that. And abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's what Kenites do when they stay and, and go against the teachings of Almighty God. Verse 45, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Do you want to know why? Listen to it. He that is of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. They were the tares, the Kenites, the offspring that Satan planted himself, as Christ would say in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 35, kept secret from the foundations of the world. This is what John is calling them, you offspring of the serpent, right from the garden, the first murderer. And, and naturally he tells them, you, if, if you would bring forth worthy fruit we we could we could make children of god out of you i don't want you to i don't want you to overlook that even though they were kenites if they would bring forth a proper fruit they could they could be children of god that's up to the individual returning to luke uh, chapter 3 the next verse please and we go with verse 9 and now also the axe is unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's what's going to happen to the tares at the, at the, um, at, at the end of the millennium. They will have an opportunity even through the millennium to receive the truth. But uh, Father will take care of business when it comes time. He is a consuming fire, and that fire will, will um, take care of any problem we might have there. Verse 11, he answered and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. In other words, if you have more than you need, share with someone. 12, then came also also publicans, that's politicians, to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? 
What, what can we do to be saved? 13, and he said unto them, extract no more than that which is appointed you. In other words, tax uh, politicians and tax gatherers like to kind of get a little greedy. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. It still goes on till t today. And um, what, what he's saying here is only take what is right and necessary, no more. 14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. In other words, don't get greedy and take more than is necessary. Don't do violence to any person that is a friend. That's what he's saying. Because many, I, I, because many people use this particular verse to use against our armed forces, that's not, it's not talking about our armed forces that protect this nation that grants us the freedoms to teach the word of God and to live freely and serve God. God would say in Psalms 144, uh, the prayer of the soldier, help me to have the power and strength in my arm to put the enemy under my feet. In other words, just destroy him. Uh, that, that's what God intends to happen if someone oppresses. But otherwise, those that you're just passing through, be good to them. 15. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, I mean, they, they could feel the spirit of Elijah presence, his presence there. And, and the divine intervention of Almighty God. And naturally, he was not Messiah. But he was the forerunner. And listen to John's word, 16. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of his shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And, and, uh, and so it would be. You know, uh, every time I read this, my mind goes to Christ's words concerning this John. I mean, he wore prophet's clothing and uh, honey and locusts by the River Jordan as he sustained himself. And uh, Jesus would say, what did you go down there to see? Some man in fine clothing? You, you find them downtown. In, in, in fancy houses. He said, no. What did you go down there to hear? A reed shaken in the wind? Meaning somebody that would listen to some preacher over here for 20 minutes and believe that. And then the wind changed your direction and you'd hear some preacher over here for five minutes. No. John was straight on, straight arrow. The truth of God without repentance. That's why he would nail the Kenite right there, if you would, to with truth and nail him right there whereby he did not have a hope of if he did not bring forth fruit meant for repentance. Well, well what would meet be meant for, what fruit for repentance? A change of heart and loving Almighty God. That's what repentance requires. And even regretting what you have done in the past that would cause you to need repentance. That brings back by genuine repentance. That's what John taught, was repentance and preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And next verse, please, they are in this uh, 17. Whose fan is in his hand, speaking of Christ now, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into the, his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable, and he is a consuming fire. The fan is a winnowing fan. The floor is a thrashing floor where you beat the grain from the husk and, and, um, and then you pick it up and <clears throat> the winnowing fan puts a breeze. If the wind's blowing strong enough, you don't even need a fan. <clears throat> you simply pick it up and 
the chaff blows away and the grain being heavier falls into the container whereby you bring it into the garner and store it for valuable food. Well, Christ does that to people. He separates the good from the bad. And his word will do that. Christ's word will separate people, would-bes from those that be. It doesn't take long where you can spot who is truly a lover of the Lord Jesus Christ, he who paid the price on that cross to bring forth repentance, the ultimate, the highest, that John is describing of the Son himself, then that brings it forth and and that true repentance changes lives. It gives you it gives you a destiny and a purpose, a purpose to follow God, to be somebody, to be able to help people, to be able to lead people and direct people. What you do it? No, the Word does it. In teaching that word and teaching the way, the way is the path, and the path is life. And it's a much better life when you follow the advice that Father gives us through John here. You know, don't, don't over-exact. Don't overtax. Be good to people. It's the good message. It's the good news. And when you bring forth that fruit, certainly um, our Father is able. Okay, Now, <clears throat> Next verse, go with verse uh, 18. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. I mean, right down to the word. Okay, Verse 19. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, I mean, John didn't make any excuses. Herod even liked old John, liked to hear him. But John nailed him. I mean, told him what he was guilty of, and uh, that made not too many points. Uh, but Herod still liked to hear him. It would be his stepdaughter that would cause him to order the head of John the Baptist removed, and um, uh, unfortunately in a drunken stupor. But John, my point being, John didn't was not a respecter of persons. If it was needed, he laid it on. Uh, tough love is a hard thing, but tough love is necessary in keeping God's ministry in its proper order and place. That is, if you want the blessings of God, you, you, you let discipline slip and you're not going to have God's blessings, period. That's just the way it is. Verse 20. Added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. And there it was. 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also, being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. I mean, there it opened, right above John and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 22. And the Holy Spirit, descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And I know the Father had to be. That here, th this one that, um, that uh, John would baptize, and the Holy Spirit giving witness to the two, now, we've come a long ways from Zacharias being down and serving his course of Abiah, and that date set there, Abiah being that date, the course, and the conception then, a few days later, of John the Baptist, this one John here, and then <clears throat> six months later, the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ on December the 25th. And... Here we have these two now as they're approaching with John already in his ministry and Christ being baptized, which basically we, we can't say it's the beginning of his ministry because even when he was 12 years old in the temple, he was ministering and they were paying attention. But his official ministry 
will begin soon here. But there, God himself, placing his presence through the Holy Spirit upon this one and how precious it was. Um, and, and, uh, and so it is. Verse 23, listen carefully. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, notice the print, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. <clears throat> now there's a great deal in that verse, and you must understand. You must understand there's one Greek word you're going to have to learn to understand it. As was supposed in Prin, the word supposed is um, is idzo. Uh, and what it means is as by law. It means like in law. You see, Joseph was not the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 1, which does not give Christ's genealogy, it gives Joseph's genealogy. And Joseph's father's name was Jacob, not Heli. So what's happening here? What's going on? By understanding the very word namidzo, you, you understand everybody has in-laws. Now, when there was one daughter and she married, the birthright of the family transferred to that man, which was Joseph in this case. Therefore, Joseph, being her husband, Mary's kin then became his in-laws, or if you want to say it, by law, or as recommended by law, the Greek word will even translate. So all we have here naturally, well then, then who is it? Joseph was the son of Heli. He was the son-in-law of Heli. You got it? It's important that you catch that. Son-in-law of Heli. And uh, because why? Because Heli was Mary's father. Naturally, because Elizabeth would be a cousin, and she being a full-blood Levite, then Mary's mother was of the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, making the Lord Jesus Christ, whose father was Almighty God, both of the house of Judah, king line, and of the house of Levi, priest line. King of kings, Lord of lords. And so you have it. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Don't miss it. There's a great deal more to this. Listen a moment, won't you please? The epistles of John, three letters written by the apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love. And we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We don't judge people. We don't have to judge people because God is judge. Judge, God does the correcting through his judgment. And um, if, if you're a believer, you can count on that. I mean, it is, it's a sure thing. It's as sure as the very word itself. So you have the right to spiritually discern. As a matter of fact, spiritual discernment is a gift from God. 
That way you can sense to a degree even what people think. Not totally, but as through a, a, a glass darkly, but you can tell, you can sense. A gift from God to recognize a worker of Satan that quick. Kenites, tares, you, they can walk in the room and you know it. Spiritual discernment. But at the same time, as you grow in the word, you have spiritual discernment to know who you should fellowship with and who you should not. If something is negative, it's not going to grow a whole lot unless it is negative in the sense of correcting Satan's work. Okay, But um, always let our Father be the judge thereof. Now, those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? Do away with the number and the address. Why? You don't need it. Why? God knows what you're talking about. God knows what you're thinking right now. You, do you understand? He made you different than anyone else. You're unique. You do have a destiny if you love him. A purpose. Mark 13 will give you, a lot of you, your purpose of witnessing against the false one. You don't have a whole lot to do. Just believe enough to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. It's a beautiful time to live at this time. Let your Father know you love him. Won't you do that? Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, Israel from Vermont. Um, I'm not a member of any church here in town because I feel very uncomfortable with the church members. They are friendly when they first visit. When you first visit the church, often they don't care anymore. It's like you are in your own. I'm not a mingling person uh, and by nature I'm very quiet so being alone is in my apartment listening to your teaching makes me happy. Is is this bad? Please let me know. No, that's, that's not, it's not bad. Wherever you're fed God's word, that's as it should be. Um, and I, I'm not going to judge the churches you've gone to there. If they're not teaching God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you're not going to be comfortable there because you are you have a thirst for hearing not man and not people but the word of God. And that is the letter God has written and it is the God, letter God has sent to us. If, if, if um, you were to have a conviction some way that you had a job and it's apparent that to you that is not your calling but you're doing fine it's not certainly not a sin and and you're you, how can you go wrong studying god's word you can't donald from kentucky what kind of pin does pastor murray wear on the left lapel of his suit coat thank you i love your style of teaching well thank you for the comment my lapel is the American flag crossed with a flag of the United States Marine Corps. From having to be an old combat veteran, um, I wear that um, pin proudly. John from Canada, Pastor Murray, how do you think the U.S. and the rest of the world will conclude? Just the way the Bible says it will. Okay. You got you got to realize though that the U.S. of A. is a superpower. In these end times, though it gets a little dented at times, but we will always control our gates. That, that is a promise from Almighty God. And that the ten tribes that went north and settled in this great nation, and Canada, and as well as Europe, we have the victory. We will always overcome, as well as the house of Judah and uh, Benjamin along with them will always overcome. I've read the back of the book, we all win. But the false one will come. And many people will be deceived. You want to make sure that you're not in that lot. At the time they appear, um, at the time of the appearance of uh, the false Christ, everybody's going to think in their minds if they're not led by God, that it's the second advent. Only, unfortunately, it's the second advent of Satan, not Christ. Um, Satan was on the earth tempting Christ, and he'll be on earth again when he comes as Antichrist. 
Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Michael throws him right out down here. You want to be set for it. We can handle it. No piece of cake. No problem. Kenneth from Arkansas. I've been going to a church for 14 years, but they teach the rapture should I leave. I never tell anyone where to go to church, and I never judge a church. I naturally teach against the so-called rapture doctrine because it's not a true teaching. Uh, unfortunately, at the sixth trump, the false Christ comes saying he's come to take us out of here, and God's against that. You can read of it in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 20. God doesn't like it for people to teach their children to fly to save their souls. He says it right plain, makes no bones about it. I'm against it, but people still do it. But the Word of God lets us know that the true Christ doesn't come until the seventh trump. Don't be deceived. We're, we're in a, a precious time. But going to, it could be that uh, the reason I can't tell you where you should go, I truly believe what I teach that God leads each of us. If there is a purpose for you going there, it may be that some person's going to ask you a question and you're going to be able to assist a person. It may just be one person, but if you help one, it's worth it, okay? But um, you have to decide that for yourself, okay? Uh, journey from Arkansas. Um, dear Pastor Murray, I'm only 10 years old, but I watch your show every morning at 6 before school. Is it okay to like someone that uh, doesn't believe in God? And, and you do, and is it okay to like someone of a different religion if you're Say like if they're Baptist or Catholic. Well, you you know, Christians can be a friend of anyone, okay? And when you stand solid on God's word, you can fellowship with anyone <clears throat> if you if you'd like. But Christians like everyone. That's that's um, one of our purposes in the world is to plant seeds to that gives a poor lost soul a chance to hear truth and learn truth. But you're, you're doing real good, but don't, don't try to preach to someone like school is not a real good place to do preaching, okay? It's just, you, you still have friends and by the way you act, they're drawn to it. And they'll, they will want to be as you are because people like you. Why? Because you like them. You stay in the word. I'm real proud of you. You, you keep studying. Willie from Illinois. My wife passed away um, three months ago. Will she be able to be part of the elect, or will that only be for those that are living at the time of the seventh trump? Will she be able to help people in the millennium? Will she know me as her husband? Yes, she will. And she will know you. We just covered that in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 20 through 25. Um, she, she is one of the remnant, and Christ is putting together an army in heaven, and they're coming with him to teach and gather with the election alive here on earth, where we, we gather. Uh, this is where a lot of people misunderstand the fourth chapter of, of uh, Thessalonians. I'm sorry, the uh, first chapter of Thessalonians, first book of Thessalonians, chapter 4, <clears throat> where it states, we that remain meet him in the air. The word ara means a spiritual body, a breath of life body. We, we, we gather back to them. We're all in that same form again where we recognize each other. And no doubt if she had God's truth, which she would or you wouldn't be listening to me um, teach, um, she'll be there. Gordon from Tennessee. What did Jesus do during the time in the tomb? <clears throat> well, you know, it is written, and it's real easy to understand. In, in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, while he was yet in the tomb, he went all the way in paradise, all the way back to the time of Noah, which that means the beginning. 
he had paid the price on the cross whereby anyone could repent. And God doesn't play partiality among people. So therefore, Christ went all the way back to the beginning and gave everyone that had passed on before an opportunity to receive him, to love the Lord Jesus Christ, and to have salvation. And as it is written in the fourth chapter of 1 Peter, uh, a lot of people took advantage of that because many captives were freed. That's what he did while, um, b before the, uh, while still in the tomb. He knocked on Satan's door of hell, you might say, and said, let my people go. Randolph from Virginia was Jesus Christ, Michael the archangel in the Old Testament. Absolutely not. You have to realize that Michael is an entity all to himself. The Lord Jesus Christ is God with us. Michael is an archangel. Jesus Christ is the anointed of Almighty God. And you, you are really knocking on the door for trouble if you uh, worship angels. And naturally, if you thought Michael was Christ, you might start worshiping Michael. Michael, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8, he throws Satan out onto the earth. He's got work to do. And, and then, uh, at that time, he serves Christ. Michael is the archangel of the house of Israel. Okay. That is to say, all of God's children. He, he is that angel, and he is spoken of in Revelation chapter 15. David from Iowa, Pastor Arnold, could you please clear up the connection between Easter and Passover? Well, actually, there's no connection. Man forms a, co a connection, but in the manuscripts of the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the word Easter is only used one time in the translation, but it is a false translation. The Greek word in the manuscripts is passel, which is Passover in the Greek tongue. And to translate Passover as Ishtar, a pagan holiday, is really, uh, um, I'll, I'll say it, it's sacrilegious. Because Ishtar, you know, if you pick up a college edition, Webster's Dictionary, a good edition, look up the word Easter, it will tell you it's a pagan holiday, but later adopted into the Christian church. Well, uh, it was where they met, the heathen met in the woods and rolled fertility eggs. Eggs always symbolize fertility and they would roll eggs in the forest. It was a sexual orgy of, of, um, in the spring that these uh, worshipers of Ishtar would do and quick like a bunny. You won't find that in the Bible, but people let those traditions of men slip in. So there is no connection, biblically speaking, it doesn't even belong in the Word of God. The word is Paschal, which is to say Passover, and um, it should have been translated that way. And woe to those that did, because it has brought much deception. Uh, Gloria from Wisconsin. Where can I find the verse in the Bible that says many will fall away in the last days? The great falling away. It's called the apostasy. You will find it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Before the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there will be a great falling away. That's the apostasy. Why? It tells you in the next verse, because Satan, the son of perdition, that's his name, one of his names, stands in the holy place showing the world that he's God. And the world that has not studied God's word will believe it because he's supernatural and he performs miracles in the sight of people. Uh, he is, uh, and, and uh, they will whore after him thinking it is Christ come to save them. Okay. 
that, that, that's a sad point, but uh, it will happen. Do you know how I know it will happen? Because it's written, written in the book of Revelation, that they're going to jump in his wagon. Uh, Richard from Washington, finally, Pastor Murray, I have a question about the spurious Messiah. I have a memory disorder somewhat, and I just haven't been to, able to get that through my head. I was wanting to know that since, if I'm correct, the generation of the fig tree will not pass till all these things be done. And that's true, Mark 13. What I'm asking is, since the Antichrist will already have been here, will it be a flesh man or only a spirit being that is helped and changed by Michael. It, it is a man in his own body. It's called Satan. <clears throat> in, in Isaiah chapter 14, it even says, is this the man that deceived the world when he's in the pit, the abyss? Uh, he, he is, but he is supernatural. He is not a flesh man. But flesh man was made in the image of God and the angels. So his body looks just like ours when he is in this dimension. And he will be in this dimension because Michael will cast him here. It's real easy to remember that when the true Christ returns, we all are changed into spiritual bodies. When the Antichrist is here, we are all still in flesh bodies, but he is in a supernatural body. But looks just like flesh, so don't let it deceive you. Um, Wayne from Wayne from maybe Nevada. I'm not sure where that uh, New Mexico, New Mexico. My question is on the Tea Party movement. Does this movement have anything to do with the deadly wound, or could it have? No, no, no. It is a move that is um, brings America's freedom back when we are about to go into a socialistic, communistic state. That won't fit in this free nation. That's, that, is, that is one of the worst things that could happen. And many men that have paid with their lives fighting communism, keeping it away from the shores of this nation, would revolve in their graves if they knew how socialistic things are being espoused upon us at this time. Uh, it won't come to pass. It won't stand. And all the Tea Party is, is the American people saying, no more. The deadly wound happens to the one world political system, not a system here in America. And they will not bring it to pass. But hopefully they're going to bring some common sense back to the nation. Ken from Georgia. Uh, the old Satan is letting... At the 1,000 years, a good chunk of, is a good chunk of time, right? The old Satan is let loose for a short time. What do you think it, he will do to trick the people into getting back into his path? Uh, at the end of the millennium, uh, he, his same old tricks. You know, people are fickle. They can be conned. A lot of people can be. They don't pay enough attention. They do not stay focused. And you could, you know, a good salesman can sell them anything. And boy, you don't have any better salesman than Satan himself. He will have, a, uh, it, it's hard to understand how that after having absolutely witnessed the seeing of the Lord Jesus Christ and hearing the word for a thousand years, that they could be con. But people are like that. God declares there will be many that will go with him. Um, th that's a sad state of affairs. But you know what? If they have been in spiritual bodies whereby they don't have any hang-ups fleshly, and, and they have heard the truth, which they will have heard, they have seen the Lord Jesus Christ, if they still choose to go to Satan, we want them gone. We want them out of here. We do not want them around us any longer, into the pit, and done away with, bought it out. Why? We're through with trouble. And you hang on to somebody like that that can be conned that easy and no focus. We don't want them around. That, that's, that'll cause you trouble. Uh, that, that, that is, there's nothing unusual about that. 
in modern day military exercises, when you're going into battle, you don't want some trooper that's not focused, that's got his mind off somewhere else. He won't only get himself killed, he'll get a lot of his buddies killed. So it takes focus, focus, focus. Um, Allman from North Carolina, why do you not discuss the keys to the kingdom? Well, I talk about it all the time. Key, the key to David is the key to the kingdom. Because if you don't have the key of David, as the great book of Revelation demands you have, then you don't really know the true Christ from the false Christ. Because you see, the key of David is David's genealogy. We got into it in today's lecture. The offspring of David, right there. Uh, Satan is not the offspring of David. And the key is to the proper genealogy to know the true Christ from the fake. And otherwise, you're going to worship Satan thinking that he is Christ. Uh, that's the keys to the kingdom, is loving the Lord Jesus Christ and standing against Satan. Then I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, it makes God's day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. He loves you when you study the letter he has sent to you. A letter giving you common sense and the path to success and the kingdom. You don't want to forget that. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen close. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.
to slumber. You know, we're going to analyze this a little bit. Many of us wonder, when you plant so many seeds and so few of them grow, what, what happened? Okay. I mean, you know what you're talking about. It's biblical. It's the traditions and doctrine that Christ taught us. Why isn't it accepted? Why can't people just grab on to it? So let's go to Romans chapter 11, and let's pick up on some of the teachings of Paul and uh, see what we might gain from the word. Why? Why are people, why can't they understand the simplicity which is in our Father's word? Romans chapter 11, verse 1, a word of wisdom for